We interrupt our regular program so that ABC News can bring you in color this special report on the Gemini 10 mission. From ABC Space Headquarters, here is ABC correspondent Peter Jennings. Good afternoon, everybody. Exactly four minutes and six seconds as we go to the Atlas Agena liftoff, and everything is going very smoothly as the National Aeronautics and Space Administration prepares its most ambitious manned space flight to date, Gemini 10. Two astronauts, both 35 years old, a naval commander, John Young, an Air Force Major, Michael Collins. John Young making his second flight into space, having been a part of Gemini 3 with Gus Grissom. Michael Collins making not only his first flight into space, but going to make his first spacewalk in the days ahead. Well, Gemini was very small. It was bigger than the Mercury. Those people like uh, uh, John Glenn who were shoehorned into a Mercury would probably uh, have considered uh, Gemini to be almost spacious. It was about it's pretty close to the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, two front seats, but with a big console in between the two seats. I thought it was, um, Gemini was a misnomer. It, it was, of course, named because uh, it was a two-seater and uh, Gemini twins. I thought it should be named Janus, which I think is, he was the god of uh, doorways. Gemini was really the link, the extremely important link between our first attempt to go into space, Mercury, and then our lunar program, Apollo. So Janus uh, looked both ways. Uh, and when he was in his doorway, he saw the old Mercury, he saw where he had to go with a new Apollo, and then he designed this program to make the bridge from one to the other. And in that sense, Gemini was essential to landing on the moon at the end of the decade as, as President Kennedy had said we should do. This is Gemini Control at 16 hours, 29 minutes, and 37 seconds after liftoff. The crew of Gemini 10 has a full day's work cut out for them. Here in Mission Control, the flight planners have come up with today's flight plan activities. If you were conservatively putting together the, uh, the Gemini 10 flight plan, I'd say we probably had about five or six days worth of work to do. And we were trying, every, John was especially commodious and I was trying to be as helpful as possible. So on the ground in our preparations, anybody who had some idea that we ought to do this or do that or perform this experiment or take, or do this one twice to ch check against prior results or whatever, we said, sure, we'll do it. Okay, we'll do it. So we ended up being almost frantic for uh, three days trying to work through all the things that we had been given to do. And we got through most of them okay. Some of them we just really didn't have time for, but uh, the important things I think we got accomplished uh, effectively. At 1 a.m. Houston time, the crew was scheduled to begin a sleep period. And a few moments ago during the pass over the Hawaii tracking station, the spacecraft communicator Ed Findell out there said that the crew was resting quietly but not sleeping yet. I was worried the first night and it was something I had never, never would have ever considered. It was that uh, without any gravity, uh, my arms just kind of rose up like this and there I was. There's nothing wrong with that except like maybe two inches in front of these fingers, there's some switch on the instrument panel that is a big no-no to turn. So I just didn't feel comfortable drifting off. I tried to, you know, kind of move them down, but gravity would sort of, or, or the lack of gravity would take them floating back. And I, I guess eventually I got that out of my mind and I fell asleep. Some 45 seconds ago, we heard from John Young via the, Con the Canary Station that the crew had depressed the spacecraft and opened the hatch. The time, 23 hours, 27 minutes. It was uh, dark when I opened the hatch. The hatch opened this way. I stood up in the seat. And one of the, uh, the really strange but nice things about it, it was, uh, it was totally uh, unairplane like uh, in an airplane, rule number one, keep the pointy end forward. And uh, we were turned 90 degrees, so the earth, the horizon, and everything was going by sideways. And that was such a 
strange uh, direction to point and to be moving. That, that in itself was uh, really arresting, but the other thing was that uh, the stars, of course, without uh, uh, any interference from our atmosphere, the stars were, were not twinkling, but they were extra bright. And my job was to take photograph signatures of the um, the ultraviolet and the uh, and the reddish stars, and compare what I saw with my camera versus what the people on the ground were seeing, the scientists with with theirs. Mike Collins reports he has taken his first exposure, an ultraviolet picture of Beta Centauri. The crew is looking south and. Uh, Collins will attempt to photograph three, st three stars in the Southern Cross. His primary target will be Beta Crucis. He'll also have uh, other target stars, Alpha Crucis and Beta Centauri. Sky was dark, black, except for the stars. Earth below curved beautifully, and the lights of the cities, you know, kind of twinkling down there. I, I mean, I could have stayed up for a couple of days just looking around, uh, but we, you know, in space you always got something else you have to do, so be quiet, get back in, get the door closed, and go back to work. Uh, I'm about 5'10", 5'10 and a half. I could not uh, stretch out all the way in the Gemini. Either my head would be banging on the roof or my feet would be uh, up under the instrument panel uh, banging against the floorboards. Uh, coming back in, I'm in this balloon suit now, so I'm bigger than I normally would be and a lot less facile in my ability to move. The trick to getting in was you just couldn't uh, get in and close the hatch. You'd bump your head against the still open hatch, which is not good. What you had to do was maneuver your legs until your knees were just under the lower rim of the instrument panel and then use that as a pivot point, and having anchored yourself there, then you could stretch back, and then you could bring your legs out. <laughs> You'd have about a quarter of an inch uh, clearance above your head. It was very tight. And, uh, and then you close the hatch, and you had a lever. You couldn't see what you're doing because it's out of your view. You have the visor down here, so you would close the hatch until you felt you were on the latches and then you would grope for the lever and you'd crank, crank, crank and you could feel it coming down, you hope, and, uh, and then when it came down you locked it and uh, John <clears throat> threw a switch and lo and behold the cabin pressure was going from zero to point one to point two all the way up to, I think we were Five PSI, I've forgotten. I think this, inside the suit, I think we were 3.7 and the, then we pumped up, I think it was five PSI was where, that was, we were home free then. We could take the helmet off and so forth. Rendezvous with the Agena was, was simple and difficult. <laughs> the pathway uh, to the Agena that the Gemini took, there was only one true and holy pathway that was gonna get you there without burning any extra fuel. <clears throat> and that meant that you were in a lower orbit and at precisely the right instant, pointed in exactly the right direction at precisely that altitude, you ignited your rocket engine for precisely the number of seconds that would put you on a trajectory going from that lower orbit up to an intersecting trajectory where the Agena was. And you didn't have to do anything if you'd done all that properly, you would just come up until there the Agena was. Gemini 10, all right, Capcom. This is Gemini 10, go, we're in SC7, over. Okay, I'm going to send you a TX, Mark. Roger, we got it. Okay, you're looking real good, we're giving you a go for the burn. I'll give you a time hack at one minute prior to your GETB. Roger. Having a little trouble with the Gemini telemetry, the Agena's real solid. He looks good, holding the attitude's real fine. Uh, what happened to us, the up and the down part were, were absolutely perfect, uh, but the left and the right part, we were off slightly to one side. So when we came to performing our braking maneuver with the Gemini, we weren't right at it, we were, it was over to one side, and that forced us to make 
really what turned out to be some fairly severe corrections. And we, we, we did a maneuver that we affectionately called in the simulator the Whifferdill. And so we did a Whifferdill around the Gemini, and then we stopped, and from then on it was textbook kind of stuff. But in that Whifferdill, we used more fuel than we should have or that we had expected to use. And that curtailed some of our later activities. Its three primary objectives were rendezvous and docking, a long duration space flight, and uh, Frank Borman uh, sat there for 14 days in, inside of something the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, slightly smaller. But we, we did the long duration successfully. We did the rendezvous and docking. And, and the third was, this, was the EVA, or the spacewalks, which of course you have to get out of the moon. We weren't quite as good on the EVA. We were very sophisticated uh, about rendezvous and docking. We had, uh, our mathematicians had thought that through. Uh, we were very well equipped uh, to cope with various things that might have gone wrong during the, the rendezvous or the docking procedure. Uh, uh, spacewalks, we were pretty crude about those. Jiminy 10, Houston, we're about a minute and a half from LOS. We hadn't really thought through uh, uh, being in weightless outside the vehicle because, of course, on the moon they have one-sixth gravity and they didn't have to worry about it. But we should have thought some of those uh, spacewalk uh, chores through a little bit differently, and we, we didn't. This is Jiminy Control, Houston. During this lull, it's worth noting that uh, Surgeon reports that both pilots during the liftoff phase showed a heart rate of approximately 100 beats. 100 beats on the, both Young and Collins. Uh, they commented that this is a, extremely low and a very, uh, is the first flight we can recall where both pilots uh, ran about the same rate. I think the main thing was, as just as a crew, uh, J Apollo 11 crew, any of the Apollo crews, uh, we'd all flown in space before. Uh, we knew it was like to sit on top of a rocket and go blasting off. We weren't all n nervous and uptight. As, well, I shouldn't say that. We were nervous and uptight, but not nearly as much so had that been our first flight experience. So having flown in space once before, I thought in, in intrinsic uh, ways was, uh, was very helpful for the Apollo. You know, I'll be outside some night and uh, wandering around. I look, oh, nice moon. I say, whoa, nice moon. I, I went up there one time, you know? Uh, kind of, so there's sort of like uh, two moons. Uh, the moon that we all have that we see that we like, it's silvery, and then, then the one that I remember from up closer. You know, I say, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, one degree north of the equator, 23 degrees east, da, da, da. Yeah, that's where I was, right there, you know, and that's, that's kind of strange, <laughs> strange feeling. It's like there's two different moons. 